Hello, hello. I'm Savannah. And I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. We are at the end of July, which means that- No, June. The end of June. (laughs) (laughs) We're at the end of June. In my head, we are at the end of June, and it's really not. We're very good at keeping time. We have a real stronghold (laughs) on- you guys the know. reality of time around here. You you guys already know. We know exactly what we're doing. <laughs> I know what day of the week it is. It's the end of June, which means that tomorrow, I'm assuming, is our yeah. live stream yes. on Patreon. So if you're a patron. And it's my turn. Oh, yeah. It's Alicia's turn. To like figure out what we're doing. I have some ideas. Oh. One of which is related to today's case. So. <gasps> oh, exciting. Yes. Exciting, exciting. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm not, I mean, I'm excited about your case, but it's not my, I'm just, I already know from the little bit that you told me at lunch that we were talking about. So that's. So you're excited, but not excited. I'm excited, but I also just like these kinds of cases just make me angry. Yeah. Well, if you like today's case, I plan on kind of doing a follow up. Ooh. On today's case, on our live stream on Patreon, for just three bucks a month, you can get ad free all the time. Yes. I know we're ad free some some of the time currently on many platforms, but if you join us on Patreon, you can get ad free episodes. You get outtakes. You get to vote on cases. Yeah. And you get our live stream. Once a month. Once a month, baby. Where sometimes we talk true crimes, sometimes we answer stupid questions. <laughs> we so always you, have fun. So we all get to know each other a little bit better. Um, yeah, but it's always been fun. So there you go. Three bucks a month. I think that's all of our business. Yeah. We don't have any shout outs, right? This Not is this, this time. Is, this We're is recording three in weeks advance in advance. I don't know. Because Savannah's got a lot of wedding business to attend to yeah not my own hey katie uh one of my friends is getting married and got a lot of traveling if you're in toronto to our canadian listeners i'll be in toronto twice in the next feel free to stalk her three and a half months i'm kidding i'll be in peterborough <laughs> like <laughs> i'm kidding don't stalk don't people. stalk people it's scary especially for us true oh my gosh <laughs> yeah if somebody stalked me i would probably hit i would hit them and then but if they happen to see you they happen to run into you. Yeah, that's fine. That would be really cool, actually. Oh, it's the end of June, but if we haven't said it, happy Pride Month. Yeah. We haven't said it because we recorded we all of our June episodes in been, May. <laughs> yeah, because we've been recording early. So, yes, happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride Month. If you don't know already, we love the gays. <laughs> <laughs> the accent. <laughs> I don't know why I'm Swedish. I was gonna say you sound like the old Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah, Hans and Franz. I'm glad you got where I was going with that. Yeah, <laughs> Kale's gonna say I sounded like the Swedish Chef <laughs> from, the, from Sesame Street. The Sesame Street too. or the Muppets? The Muppets. Well, I mean, the characters on Sesame Street are Muppets. Yes, but no, it's the Muppets. <laughs> the Muppets. That the Swedish Chef was on. Yeah. Except he doesn't. You can't make out anything. That <laughs> no, he says. he's just a wee wee. That's French. What am I talking about? <laughs> Okay. Swedish, <laughs> Swedish noises. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. So, yes. Shimp. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. And I don't know. I hope you're all doing well in the world. Pride Month can be joyful and be very hard at the same time. Yes. But we love you. And burden of proof is a safe place for you to be yes happy we pride. just want to wish everybody happy pride happy, happy pride month hope you're doing well yes okay so today's case is the murder of 10 year old joel kirkpatrick i think i've heard of this one have you well Link. maybe because it has some links to uh a big fish if you will oh my gosh are we talking about a whale <laughs> that was stupid. That Not was literally. That was literally so okay, stupid. Cool. <laughs> that was literally so stupid. That's fine. 
All right. So Joel Kirkpatrick was born July 13th, 1987 to parents Leonard, otherwise known as Len Kirkpatrick, and Julie Rhea. Some people pronounce her name Ray. Some people pronounce it Rhea. I'm really not 100% sure. Like my sources were across the board. Cool. So I'll just say Ray. Okay. The couple were high school sweethearts who married very young. Len was just 18, and Julie's parents signed off on the marriage when she was still just 17. Interesting choice. Okay. I want you to remember this. Yeah. And keep in mind that she gave birth to Joel about a year later when she was just 18. Okay. And when she gave birth to him, she was also, I believe, in school, eventually hoping to pursue a PhD in psychology. Remember those things, because it does come into play later. They're in the back of my head. Unfortunately, Len and Julie's love story did not last, and the pair divorced in September of 1994. After a long and contentious custody battle, Len was granted custody of Joel in March of 1996. That was the initial, like, okay, he gets custody, and then she, of course, petitioned back trying to fight it or appeal it and the final decision was that Len got custody and that decision was made in August of 1997. Okay, interesting. So it took, yeah, a little over a year. Most commentary on the decision agree that it was simply due to the judge's opinion that Len could provide a more stable environment because he had remarried and like bought a house Whereas Julie was still single, and I believe at the time she was attending school again, Mm -hmm. and she was renting. Okay. So, all that is to say it wasn't a reflection on Julie's parenting. Right. According to those in Julie's life, she was a great mom who loved her son dearly and cherished the time she did get to spend with him. And his last weekend with her was no exception. According to Len Kirkpatrick, Julie had asked to keep Joel an extra day that weekend because Monday, October 13th, 1997, was Columbus Day, so there was no school. And Joel was excited to have the extra time with Julie, so Len agreed. That Saturday, they spent time at the park, and Sunday, they spent time with friends, Don Hansel and her son. Sunday evening, Julie and Don sat at the dining table chatting while their sons watched the movie Aladdin. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah. And when Joel said he wanted to go to bed because he wasn't feeling great, probably because they said that like they had gone for milkshakes and such, and I think he probably just had a bit of a stomach ache. So Julie asked Don if they would like to spend the night. Dawn said she appreciated the offer but chose to go home. And then, according to Julie, she tucked Joel into bed, as she always did, and when she went to sleep, all was well. Okay. And she says that she went to sleep around midnight. Okay. Around 4 a.m., Julie was startled awake by a scream. She said she was groggy, so she called out to Joel as she kind of, like, got out of bed Because it didn't really sound like him. Okay. But who else would it be? Right. He never answered when she called out to him. And when she finally got out of bed, well, I shouldn't say finally, because it didn't take her that long, but she was groggy. So when she stepped out into the doorway between her bedroom and his bedroom, like they had a small hallway in between the two. She kind of started to enter his room, and she looked at his bed, and he wasn't there. Okay. Suddenly, a man lunged at her in the darkness from the opposite side of the bed. Oh, gosh. Okay. This is terrifying. So, if, if you're having trouble visualizing it, envision a room where the head of his bed was on the same wall as the door. And so she kind of like peeked around the corner. Oh my gosh. And sees that he's not there. And then on the other side of the bed, there's just like a foot, maybe a foot or two 
between his bed and the wall. Oh, that's terrifying. And that's where the man was standing. He jumped across the bed, and then he lunged at Julie. She began struggling with him, but the weird thing was he initially acted like he was attacking her. But instead of attacking her, he just, like, tried to push past her then. Like, once it was, like, at first he went to attack her, and then she fought, started, like, pushing back or whatever. And then all of a sudden, he, it was like he was just trying to get away from her. Okay. Which was weird, but weird. she's like, he's clearly trying to flee. So she grabbed at him again and again, trying to stop him. She ended up falling to the floor, and he was basically dragging her along the carpet. Like, she's holding onto his leg, and he's dragging her. The struggle continued down the hall, through the dining area, and, like, in between the dining area and kitchen, through the living room, out the door, into the garage. Wow. Okay. As he got to the exterior door of the garage, she again attempted to grab him, and he busted the door out, trying to get out and away from her. And then the two end up, like, starting to wrestle in the backyard. He apparently grew impatient at that point of just trying to get away. And so he turned on her and he backhanded her. And then when she fell to the ground again, he like slammed her head into the ground a couple times. Okay. Until she stayed down. That's horrible. Once she's on the ground and he starts to step away, she looks up at him and he stepped away, but he took off his, the ski mask he was wearing. And so she got a look at him, but only like a profile. Right. Okay. When the coast was clear, Julie ran to neighbors Mac and Nancy Seed's house for help. She was screaming for them to call the police. And the couple let her in and she told them that someone had taken Joel, kidnapped him. Because he was just gone. That's what her brain went to when she didn't see him there but there's a strange man in her house that's what i would think too because i'm like well where would he have gone right so mac dialed 911 while nancy spoke with julie and nancy says that julie had a big welt on her eye and some other scrapes like small scrapes along her like elbows and on her arms and then as nancy began to take a closer look at the abrasion on her arms first but she, like, hesitated to touch them. She claimed that Julie's demeanor, like, suddenly changed to very almost nonchalant and that Julie said, quote, you don't have to worry about me. I don't have AIDS, which Nancy thought was unusual. Okay, I mean, okay. Nancy also thought it was strange that then when she went to look at the abrasions on Julie's knees, Julie, again, like, went from being upset to kind of like sounding like a small child would and she looked down and said oh yeah I have boo-boos on my knees okay that is weird so two officers arrived first to the scene one stayed with Julie while the other entered the house as he walked through the house nothing was really disturbed there was no furniture overturned no items thrown about No obvious sign of forced entry because the two storm doors that had broken glass, the glass was on the outside of the door, not the inside. So, okay. The officer found a steak knife on the hall floor, and upon entering Joel's room, he found that Julie wasn't mistaken. Joel was missing from his bed, but he was not taken. On the floor next to the bed, on the far side of the bed. Like in between the bed and the wall. Yes. Was 10-year-old Joel already deceased from multiple stab wounds to his chest. Oh, my gosh. Who in the actual F stabs a 10-year-old? It's it's insane. I have so many questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, you'll have lots. I'm very upset. Like, this is... Just be patient because... Many of your questions will probably be answered. Yeah, that's why I'm not asking. But you will have a lot of them throughout. But I just don't. I think, is this the first 
this isn't the first child victim, but it's one of the only we've not done a ton. We've done some child victims. I guess. I mean, yours are usually like, like teens. Teens on other teens or teen on child. Yeah. But I've done at least I know now that I'm thinking one about it. Two. We've done a, a few. Yeah. This one just feels different. Well, it's shocking cuz it's not like Oh, somebody picked him up. Somebody kidnapped him. Somebody. It, it's shocking. Like, you just yeah. break into a house and kill this kid. Yeah. Cause which is what police question, too. Well, I and we've question. also discussed that it's very rare that robberies end in murder, especially the murder Correct. of a child. But that's the thing, is this wasn't even a robbery. robbery. Nothing was taken. Everything was in place. Right. But home invasion, I just think. Yeah. But yep. right, I'm with you. Yep. So officers in Lawrenceville, Illinois, which is where this is at, were not equipped to handle a case such as this. So at some point they did call in the Illinois State Police to investigate with them, but I think they are the ones that initially like handled the crime scene. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So at the scene. When Julie is questioned, she gives them her account of what happened, just as I told you. Mm-hmm. And she described the perpetrator as being young, possibly a teenager due to his build and features. Okay, I can see that. They had her sit down at some point with a composite artist to create a rendering of the man's profile and description, which was that he was somewhere between 5'9 and 5'11" thin possibly like 130 to 150 pounds okay and she remembered that he was wearing camo pants okay so he went to the army surplus store probably yes which doesn't narrow it down a lot no (laughs) the demographic of the army surplus store yeah (laughs) true (laughs) uh however the investigators were skeptical Julie had told them that she was sure she'd locked the front door before going to bed, but could not remember if she'd locked the door between the garage and the kitchen. Okay. While it might explain the lack of forced entry, investigators believed the rest of the scene seemed staged. The steak knife found on the floor had been taken from a butcher block in Julie's kitchen, and it did not have a lot of blood on it. Was it a serrated steak knife or a non-serrated steak knife? It was serrated. Um, so it to would my have... knowledge, it was serrated. So, oh, yeah, we're, t- oh, there's theories. Okay. There's theories. There's theories. There's theories, there's theories. on the knife. <laughs> oh, girl. There's it's, theories. Yeah. It's, not the theories. Wow. It had some blood on it, but not a lot. They believed that it had been placed on the floor rather than dropped or thrown because there was a lack of blood spatter around around it. it. I had that same thought. I'm basically a detective now. (laughs) I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. They were also puzzled by the lack of disturbance in the home, as well as why Julie got away with just minor injuries. Well, if her head was bashed on the floor, wouldn't she have, like, head injuries? And it, Well, it was in the grass, number one. Okay. So it wasn't, like, concrete or right. something, you know. And she hit, like, her eye or, like, just above her eye. So it really, like, yeah. she did have just minor okay. injuries. But the ER doctors did confirm that her injuries could be consistent with her description of events right but the other thing that isn't consistent is if they're running through the whole house grappling with each other it should be disturbed like you would think that there would be signs of that that's what the police thought i've got the impression based on the injuries that her knees were the most scraped up that like it really was just her trying to throw all her weight into holding him back right than anything and he mostly was just dragging her right in which case, he didn't necessarily run her into the furniture and so you know. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So, it, okay. It just I don't know. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Well, I just don't I, know what direction we're going in here. I know. Nobody does. 
Nobody did. Okay. It can be seen both ways. So I'm just playing devil's advocate in that, yes, it's kind of strange, but it's not completely implausible. Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So investigators still very skeptical because of the crime scene. Later, testing confirmed that four blood droplets that they found on the back of Julie's t-shirt were, in fact, Joel's. And she never even... She never saw him. And on the back of her... Mm-hmm. Okay. But, I mean, I guess if, like, perpetrator had come at her from behind, maybe? or Because he, like, grappled her. He could have, like, grabbed the back of her shirt or something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ed Parkinson, the state appellate prosecutor admitted that she became a suspect the very morning of the crime. It was strongly circumstantial, but not looking good for Julie. Mm -hmm. When questioned at the police department, they confronted her about it, insisting that they thought that she did it. Julie denied the accusation and never changed her story. As gossip about the tragic event rushed through the small town, police received several tips. One of them was a claim that some teenagers at a party were bragging about killing someone and didn't check out. And despite Julie's story remaining the same, they claimed that all the leads were followed. They did their job. And everything led back to Julie. Right? Like, there's, there's nothing, to, nothing else. According to Julie and her attorneys, She always cooperated with investigators, and she did take two polygraph tests administered by independent examiners and passed both of them. Without enough solid evidence to arrest anyone, the case just sat there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, really. You have to have more. In that time... Julie moved on with life the best that she could. She actually moved to Bloomington, Indiana and remarried a man named Mark Harper. On the first anniversary of Joel's death, her family put up a reward for information on the case, but got nothing. Right. In 2000, Ed Parkinson, as I said, the state appellate prosecutor, was assigned to the case and was determined to move forward. He presented the case to a grand jury and got an indictment for capital murder on October 12, 2000, nearly three years to the day of the crime. That's a big jump. Capital murder? Mm Mm-hmm. Capital means they're going to kill her, Mm -hmm. in case y'all don't know. They couldn't arrest her, but now they're going to arrest her and kill her that seems like a really big leap it is when they didn't have any new evidence oh well i was gonna ah, like i I feel like there's gonna have to be some sort of yeah after some fight on the extradition from indiana she tried to stop that but eventually julie surrendered with the belief that the evidence would show that she was innocent with all of her savings exhausted on a private attorney Julie filed a petition requesting the appointment of two attorneys qualified to defend a capital case. Yeah, I mean, that's difficult. Her request was basically done at a time where a reform had recently passed, but wasn't actually supposed to take effect till like just months later. So she was requesting it be allotted to her early. And the reform required anyone facing the death penalty be provided to capital qualified attorneys for their defense. It was designed to protect innocent people from execution due to ineffective counsel because they got appointed, you know, just your run-of-the-mill public defender that doesn't have experience. This is a whole different beast when you're dealing with Mm -hmm. capital cases. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've talked about it before. Like, when it becomes a capital case, it's no longer... Prove them innocent. It is save their life. It is a yes. completely different ballgame. Yes. Well, in response to this. By the way, I think her request is fair. 
Absolutely. They're asking, they're already going to put this into place and she needs it now. I think that that's a very fair thing for them to petition for. But in response to this, Ed Parkinson, our lovely prosecutor, filed that they were no longer seeking the death penalty. Okay. Right. Because he doesn't want her to have good counsel. Exactly. Not only did it mean that she was appointed a public defender, but it meant that she was no longer entitled to receive any other death penalty resources like the Capital Litigation Trust Fund, which provides funding for the defense to do investigation of their own. Interesting. I never thought about that, that if you are. Yeah, that's interesting. Due to all the publicity, though, she was granted a change of venue to Wayne County in Illinois. Now, we're at the trial. The prosecution's case rested strongly on her story being absurd and simply not plausible given the physical evidence. Pause. Pause. This is good that this case came after my case last week. Mm -hmm. Because, same thing, they fought through an entire house. And if you Mm -hmm. haven't listened to it, spoiler alert, she gets off. It Mm -hmm. was an incredibly bizarre and some people would say unbelievable story but she got off but she got off and the jury thinks that that's the truth Mm -hmm. so it's it's happened before we've seen it in in the late 70s early 80s Mm -hmm. this is in 2000 like the trial takes place i think in 2002 so there's precedent well ed parkinson says it's total nonsense He proclaimed that the glass being shattered to the outside of the doors was a clear indication that they were broken from inside. Because Joel was stabbed through his bedding, they argued that it protected her from blood spatter and even wiped the blood off the knife as she pulled it back out. Even though there was blood spatter all around the bed. Right. So... The blood being pulled off the knife as you pull it back out of the right. bedding makes sense. But there still was blood spatter. Yeah. It's not going to keep it off of her. It's just going to keep it off the knife. Correct. Theoretically. But she did not have any blood on her except for the four droplets on her back. And they weren't spatter. They were droplets. Right. And there is a difference. Yes. So next, they claimed that the knife couldn't have been thrown or dropped, as I said, because there was no spatter on the carpet. They had an officer who was on the scene testify that there wasn't any indication of a struggle in the backyard because he saw no tracks of any kind in the dew on the grass that morning. Looks confused. Um, okay. Sure, if you want to say that. If you want to say that that's a valid argument. It's a potentially valid argument. I'll give them. But you'll see why it's not in a little bit. Because what time of year was the crime? October. And where are we? Illinois. Okay. So. So, yeah. It is a potentially valid argument. Yeah, because it's not like summer dew. It's like not frost, but it's like, you know, it's been a while since I've lived in a place that had dew. Yeah. We don't get dew in Florida. We get wet i mean we do but it's but not, it's not like yeah it's not it's the same. not the same it's not the same mostly because we don't really have a ton of grass yeah <laughs> we have weeds and sand and sand okay so throughout the entire trial i'm sure it will not shock anybody that basically they put julie's character on trial how do you, other i mean they don't have a ton of evidence to mm-hmm. back it they don't have a choice but They even had her ex-husband, Len Kirkpatrick, testify that she had considered an abortion when she found out she was pregnant with Joel. Doesn't seem relevant. Remember what I said in the beginning? She was 18. She was 17 when she was married. She was 18 when she had Joel. And she had been in the pursuit of a PhD. I think a lot of us would consider all our options. Right. Under well, those circumstances. And it doesn't mean that she doesn't love her son. It, <laughs> right. It's not. And so that's my next thing right. is regardless of what she contemplated when she first found out she was pregnant, she, number one, chose to have him anyway. Right. 
And number two, by all other accounts, by family, by friends, everyone said she was a great mother and always very affectionate with Joel. Right. And Joel loved being with her. Also, can I just say, it doesn't seem super ethical to put the ex-husband, who is also the father of the victim, on the stand. Because he's obviously going to have a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. And he did. And because he, he was also convinced that Julie killed Joel because they had just months prior, remember the the custody battle yeah. had just ended in August and then this happened in October. And so he was convinced that she did it in a quote, if I can't have him, neither can you right. sort of revenge. And I mean, he's in, he's grieving. It's, I mean, I, I can't imagine grieving for your 10 year old child, especially when you don't have answers. I can, I totally see yes. how that happens. I'm not blaming him no. for doing it, but if you would just hear the prosecutor speak for yeah. even a minute, it's just icky. Just as we said, I think we also talked about that. In last week's episode, yeah, where you said when somebody's likable or not likable, yeah, prosecutor not likable, like not even a little bit, yeah, it's just, and this is why I couldn't be a prosecutor because, like, or in my head, I'm just thinking, like, that's just not okay to put him on the stand ethically. I just feel like that's not for his mental health, but he did it because. They didn't have anything else. They didn't else. have anything, so they had to. So they had to attack her character. When, what better way to attack someone's character than to put their ex-spouse yeah, up, right. up there? The other thing I think really drives this, and I'm sure like you, it, it, I just want to clarify, you said he's an appeal prosecutor too. Uh, I'm glad you caught that. I tried to so, emphasize it. <laughs> the reason- That'll come into play as well. I think it'll come into play for a couple, other, for a couple reasons. I don't know what you're mm -hmm. going to say, but my first thought when you said appeal was- they want this case off the docket. They want it gone. The judge doesn't want it on their case anymore. So he was t he was told, you know, directly or indirectly, get this off. I don't care how you do it. Get it off. Not to mention, this isn't what he does. So he's trying to keep it from being an appeal thing. <laughs> so she's firing from the hip. Bang, bang. But, but she's good at aiming. I don't know. It's just, I see, we Sorry, see it a lot. Stupid. We, <laughs> we see it a lot. And like, you have cases that if they've been on the judge's docket for like more than a couple years, they're like, get this off my docket. And they're told by, you know, I'm not attorney sure that, general. Like, I'm not sure because it sounds like based on everything that I found, mm -hmm. it sounds as though as soon as this guy got appointed, mm-hmm. He just like had it out for her in this case. Yeah. Like, it was like kind of That's why it sat there for three years with nothing. And then this guy gets appointed mm -hmm. and it's like he's trying to prove something now right. that he's been appointed to this position. He also knows the back end of it too. So he's going to do everything he can to keep any sort of appeal. He's going to block any ass avenue of appeal that she might have. Well, we will get into the prosecutor a little bit more when it comes to appeals. But let's move on to the defense. As we said, she got a public defender. I think he did the best that he could given experience and mm -hmm. circumstances. And they have no budget. Yeah. Like they, they got nothing. You, you have nothing to work with. Yep. So he didn't have much of a defense that he was able to present in this trial due to that. But he did call several witnesses to attest to Julie's character, including Dawn, her friend that had been visiting that mm -hmm. evening. And obviously, Dawn was like, why would she invite me to sleep over if she had the intention to kill her son? Like, that right. doesn't make sense. They also countered the blood evidence, but they basically just countered with, like, what they could. Right. They didn't go into the depth that they needed to. If you will. Right. Well, because you would really need an expert, with, you know, and Correct. if you don't have a budget, how are you going to get how an expert? How are you going to do that? Exactly. Because, um, I mean, yeah, the court will pay for an expert, but it not a whole lot and not top of the line. Right. So he also 
unfortunately, (laughs) insisted that Julie not testify. But he said that he did so out of fear that she wouldn't hold up under cross-examination. He said that she did not answer questions directly, which, of course, is problematic when yeah. you're under that line of questioning. Like, and, if you're just yeah. a person that I've, I've admitted it on here, I would be terrible because I do struggle with answering yes, no. When when there's more detail that I feel matters. And right. in this case, she absolutely would have had a difficult time with that, no doubt. But unfortunately, he felt like it was a catch-22. If I put her on the stand and she does that, it could be misperceived as being dishonest. But unfortunately, it may have been detrimental to the case to yeah. not have Julie testify, unlike trials where the defendant shouldn't because they are likely guilty and so they shouldn't because they're scared they're gonna perjure themselves right yeah because and i mean a jury can be instructed all they want like don't take it into consideration or don't you know use that fact as evidence but it exactly but after only five or six hours of deliberation the jury came back with a verdict of guilty Julie was sentenced to 65 years, and jurors later said in an interview that her story just didn't seem plausible. Several of them agreed that it didn't make sense that a man would have just broken in and killed Joel, but walked away from her. One of them specifically said it was the testimony of the officer stating he found no tracks in the dew that convinced her, and others said it was the no forced entry or the fact that the man didn't bring his own weapon that he just took a steak knife i don't think that's that weird that was a big ordeal that was like a big part of it that happens all the time why is that weird because they had never heard of it in Uh, this little town of illinois which i mean i'm not saying that's their fault but it is just not that weird that they thought it was very weird. And the prosecutor it, pushed it hard. Either way, I don't think that's that weird. If I was going to kill somebody, I wouldn't bring something that I had to dispose of. I would leave it there. With You're on a good track. Okay. You're on a good track. So the few jurors that were truly conflicted about whether she were guilty or not said that it was Julie's lack of testimony. Which is so that- hard because they're instructed by the judge. I know they are. Mm-hmm. To not take that as as yep. evidence in any way. But most people do. But it's so hard as a human it, being to yep. ignore, like, when you're given jury instructions, and I hate that. Yep. So that interview with the jurors aired on 2020 on May 31st, 2002. I was a wee babe. Mm-hmm. They also interviewed Julie for that episode, and the world got to hear her story in her words for the first time. Julie's desperate hope that someone would hear her story and be able to help her came true. True crime author Diane Fanning saw the episode and was shook when she heard Julie's story. Diane was in the middle of writing a book about serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells at the time. Interesting. He was on death row after being convicted of murder. On December 31st, 1999, He entered a home through an open window of a bedroom, walked through that room where one boy was sleeping, looked in on the family's youngest daughter sleeping, but decidedly attacked two girls sleeping in another bedroom. One was the family's daughter, Kayleen Harris, the other, a friend sleeping over, 10-year-old Crystal Searles or Surles. Okay. Crystal watched in horror as he sexually assaulted 13-year-old Kayleen and stabbed her 16 times. Terrified, Crystal promised not to tell. She put her hands, like, up to cover her neck Mm -hmm. or, like, hold herself, and he ripped her hands away and slashed her throat. And then he turned around and left just as quietly as he'd arrived. Never woke the parents. 
never touched any of the other kids. Unable to talk, let alone scream, Crystal ran for help, thinking he'd surely killed the whole family. So just like Julie, Mm -hmm. thinking that Joel was kidnapped, this girl thought he must have gone and killed the parents and everybody else, too, because nobody's saying anything. Nobody's coming. And she can't scream or anything, so she runs out of the house. She goes to a neighbor's to call for help, and Crystal miraculously survived. Wow. The 10-year-old girl was ultimately the one to bring down the monster who had killed more than 22 people. Oh, I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. So Diane Fanning had been corresponding with him for her book. And when she saw the 2020 episode and heard people saying that Julie's story was preposterous, she knew it might not be. No, it's not. She said no. And that was one of the things was... She said, Tommy Lincells has entered homes to kill his victims with no weapon in hand, using items from the victims' homes Mm -hmm. on more than one occasion. Diane was almost done writing her book, but decided she needed to follow up on this story. So she wrote to Tommy, explaining to him that she'd watched an interview with a woman who claimed that someone broke into her house and killed her son. She went on to say that the prosecutor claimed it was ridiculous to believe that someone would break in to kill a child with a knife from their own kitchen. But Diane was careful not to share any of their information, no names, no dates, no location, nothing else. She literally just said, I thought this was like wild. Because he'd been in jail since 98, you said? He was... That was the very end of 1999, so he had been in prison since, like, 2000. Okay. And he was on death row. So Diane says later in an interview that she really just thought that it may be someone like Tommy. Like, she just wanted to reach out to him and be like, what are your thoughts about this? Because he had been caught, and he had confessed to a bunch of murders. Okay. Diane Fanning had said, oh, well, when I said, like, this woman is sitting in prison and he was like, yeah, there there's been. Yeah, there were people in prison for uh, crimes that I committed. That's not uncommon. Like, you know. Yeah. But at the time when she first wrote to him, she just thought maybe it's someone like him. And maybe if he can give some sort of insight to this. I don't know. Maybe it would help. I don't think that she expected his response. I'm like, I had to Google what he looked like. Sorry. I'm I'm not texting or anything. I'm genuinely, I had to know. Tommy wrote back, quote, about that woman claimed someone breaking into her house. Was that like maybe two days before my Springfield, Missouri murder? Maybe on a 13th? Diane could not believe it. Joel was killed on October 13th, 1997. And a 13-year-old Stephanie Mahaney was killed on October 15th, 1997 in Springfield, Missouri. Wait, I thought that Joel was killed in 2002. No, that's when Oh, that's, that's when she was finally tried cuz the Oh, I had the sat, dates wrong. Yeah, no, he was killed in 1997. It sat for three years. Okay. They indicted her in October of 2000. Okay. But her trial didn't actually take right, place right, until right. like close to 2002. I had it in my head that the that he wasn't killed in 2000. And that's, I don't know how I had that mixed up. No. Yeah. Oh, so my reaction would have been very different. He definitely did it. So Diane first contacted the Texas Ranger that had worked the case in which Tommy had been convicted. And because she had previous contact with him. Right. She explained what she wrote to him and she explained about the case. And he agreed that it was very plausible that Tommy could be telling the truth. It was clear that no one in Illinois was interested in reopening the case, though, as they all believed that Julie was guilty and she was convicted. So Diane ended up writing it into her book. And then the journalists at 2020 saw it and decided to follow up. So correspondent Lynn Schur 
went to the prison in Texas to interview Tommy Lynn Sells. He confessed to murdering Joel Kirkpatrick, and most of the details that he gave matched what Julie Ray had been saying the whole time. And he has no idea. Exactly. When Lynn asked him why he would go to a house intent on killing someone and not bring his own weapon, he responded with, quote, I guess you ain't ever seen me kill with my bare hands. <laughs> I have two lethal weapons, <laughs> thunderbolt and power strike. <laughs> that's a Dwight Schrute quote. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's not even what he says. I just couldn't think of it. Anyway, that was stupid. That's not funny. But well, I mean, he's, to listen to him talk, it kind of is. But 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 seriously, it's yeah, that's it's crazy, crazy that they didn't like mm-hmm. that nobody put that together before right so and well, when you when i get to the rest this is why i'm like on the edge of my uh, seat when i get to the rest you'll really be pissed as to how they didn't put it together but according to they that, didn't put it together because they didn't want to put it together that's the reality and i know mm-hmm. that's what's coming so according to diane fanning tommy had confided that despite killing his victims in multiple ways he prefers strangling them with his bare hands because he can watch the light go out in their eyes. Right, as, as uh, killers say. Now, keep in mind, he had been on death row for a while and did not have access to media, TV, internet, right. none of it. So he couldn't have known the details to this crime right. unless he were there. Shockingly, none of this is what gave Julie a second chance in the court system. In 2004, her appeal was granted for a new trial due to a, quote, technicality that I personally see as more of an elephant in the room, and you have already caught on to it as well. (laughs) Ed Parkinson, the state appellate prosecutor, had usurped his authority. He's an appellate prosecutor. Yeah, he can't. So at the time he presented the case to the grand jury for the first indictment, he was only supposed to represent the state in appellate cases. However, by the time her appeal was granted, the statutes had been changed and Ed Parkinson did have the authority to try the case. And he decided, I'm going to do just that. But before he didn't. Yeah. But now he did. So he wasn't going to be proven wrong. Right. So as soon as Julie walked out of the prison, practically, boom, there's a warrant. We're we're recharging you. Which is ridiculous to me because this is going to sound ridiculous. But if he's a, a normal human being, why would you want the mother of this child to be the one who killed him? Why wouldn't you look at the serial killer who's literally saying, oh, yeah, I did that all the time. And, yeah, I committed that one right before I committed this other one. Look, I have all these details. And you know you don't have a ton of information. You're so blindsided by what, by what you want to be the truth. I think it's pride. It's right. They don't That's, want to admit that they, from the beginning, very beginning, were wrong. That any of them messed up. So and it's just and and you have to be like that to be a prosecutor because you have to have the determination. Yeah, kind of. I mean, some prosecutors are I, a lot of prosecutors are well intentioned or obviously they're right on the you know for the justice system, whatever. But a prosecutor like this is who yeah. gives all prosecutors bad names or attorneys in general. Like listening right. to them talk, I was like, yeah. That's exactly the kind of attorney that I was terrified that I would end up working for someday. Right. And ew, no. This is making me very upset. His his attitude towards this is like, and I'm not yeah. saying that I don't want him to like look for justice if he thinks that that's where it is. Yeah, but when but there's it's, new it's, evidence presented, why wouldn't you be right. open to hearing that? If it's clearly, if he it was walks not, like he a duck and it talks like a duck. I'll get to what he said about oh, gosh, that as okay. well. Yeah. So, Julie was arrested again, but her family was able to make bail for her, and so she was free for the first time in over two years. Then... And maybe able to start grieving her child, except no. Yeah. No, now she had another battle on her hands, because she... 
her appeal process didn't it, it all it did was grant her a new trial yeah it didn't it didn't say okay you're off so the illinois innocence project mm-hmm. then joined julie in her battle and their investigator found some interesting evidence that was never presented at the first trial because she didn't have the resources a man named Alan Berkshire had come forward with a story about a strange man he and his son encountered at the local diner the Friday evening before Joel's murder. Alan said the man was obviously drunk or high or something, but struck up conversation with him and his son. He explained that the man had said he was originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and that he was passing through Lawrenceville on his way back home to help his sick mother. Alan was a bit disturbed at the man's interest in his son and said that when his son showed he was uncomfortable with the interaction, the man tapped him on the shoulder and said, quote, I'll bet you're afraid of me, aren't you? And then creepily chuckled and said, quote, you know, I guess everybody ought to be afraid of me. I got two weapons, my bare hands. Everybody ought to be afraid of me. Yep. That's the voice I've decided he has. He said when the man left, Alan saw him walking toward railroad tracks heading south. It turned out that the county sheriff sat and listened to Alan's story, but never followed protocol in taking an official documented statement and apparently never followed up on it. Another person informed police at the time that they saw a man walking down the railroad tracks wearing camo pants that same weekend. The camo pants have come back. I knew that detail would be important. A report was filed, but they hadn't considered it a viable lead, even though the railroad tracks head right toward Julie's neighborhood. Then a woman who worked at a local Greyhound bus station informed officers that she had sold a ticket to a man that matched the composite sketch just after the murder. She said the entire encounter stood out to her because he seemed nervous and he insisted, I need a ticket right away. And he needed a ticket right away to Winnemucca, Nevada. That's a fun word. Yeah. She said that the location also stood out because she had never even heard of Winnemucca, Nevada. Yeah, and you, like, have to go there right now. Yeah, so, like, who needs to go to Winnemucca, Nevada (laughs) right now? Right. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure somebody does, but it's just a random. So the Illinois state investigators claimed to have followed up on that, but they said that it went nowhere. But but you have a name of who bought tickets. But when the private investigator heard this and re-interviewed the woman, he went, huh, that is pretty weird because, like, Winnemucca, like, who's heard of that place? And he's like, but I know I have heard of that place. And so he went back through everything he had been doing, including Diane Fanning's book, and lo and behold, there it was. Texas Rangers had placed Tommy Lynn Sells in Winnemucca, Nevada at the time of his arrest. So it, like, bruh, sorry. The investigator also looked into the bus route from Lawrenceville, Illinois to Winnemucca, Nevada and found that one of the stops was in St. Louis, Missouri. As I mentioned before, two days after Joel's murder, Tommy killed 13-year-old Stephanie Mahaney in Springfield, Missouri, which is really close to St. Louis. They also confirmed that Tommy had lived in St. Louis and his sick mother was actually still there. You know, just like the creepy man at the diner said. Yeah, who said, you ought to be afraid of me and my killer in hands. Yep. So the investigator went back to interview Alan Berkshire. And he gave a verbal description of the man he saw at the diner that pretty much matched Julie's description. And when he was shown the composite sketch of Alan, I'm sorry, when he was, when Alan was shown the composite (laughs) sketch, he agreed it looked similar to the man he encountered. So next, the investigator scoured Julie's statements to compare to Tommy's statements and found that many of the details matched perfectly. 
He also dug deeper into Tommy's crimes to find similarities between them. And one thing he discovered could have explained why Tommy killed Joel but spared Julie. Earlier in his serial killing career, Tommy predominantly targeted women in their 20s or 30s, but he also wasn't one to discriminate as he had victims of all ages and gender. However, on May 13th, 1992, he attacked 19-year-old Fabian Witherspoon in Charleston, West Virginia, after she met him when he was panhandling, and she offered to take him and go get him some food. Well, she took him to her apartment to gather up some food, and she asked him to wait outside. When she went inside, he entered the apartment anyway, and when she turned to gather some items, he grabbed a knife, and then he took her to the bathroom and trapped her in the bathroom. In his attempt to rape her, she fought back by hitting him in the head repeatedly with a ceramic duck that she had sitting on the back of her toilet. And that is why we have knickknacks. <laughs> um, she then got control of the knife and stabbed him, hitting both his kidney and liver, as well as slicing his testicle. Hell yeah, girl. They had a struggle further. They must have, like, fought and ended up in, like, the main living area of the apartment or house. I, I think it was an apartment, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway... She said the next thing she knew, he hit her over the head with a piano stool, like, and really, like, bashed her head. Yeah, that's a lot. That's heavy. But then he tried to get away. I mean, he technically did get away at first, but the thing was, is she survived. He didn't kill her. Like, he just knocked her out for a little bit. And then he had told her his real name. (laughs) Freaking idiot. Plus, his injuries were severe enough that he landed himself in the hospital. So, ultimately, at that time... And their time, specific injuries. Yes. So, at that time, he was arrested and he took a plea deal of five years. So, there's a five-year period between 92 and 97 that he was in prison and nobody was killed. Okay. Well, not nobody, but you know what right. I mean. <laughs> nobody died. Nobody <laughs> across the U.S. died. No. So when he was released, he seemed to be more particular about his victims and how vulnerable they were, mostly choosing children from that point, and or he would break into homes and attack people while they were sleeping. The picture comes together. So Julie's second trial took place on July of 2006 in the small town of Carlisle, Illinois. She got a change of venue again because... Obviously. Yes. This time, she was armed with an excellent defense team and evidence from a thorough investigation. The prosecution presented basically all the same evidence with all the shock and awe. But the defense team was able to present the evidence they found, and they questioned the state's investigation procedures at the crime scene. Apparently, at the crime scene, they had not actually handled forensic evidence as if it were a break-in. Very few fingerprints were taken. There's pictures of mishandling Joel's bedding. Like, they're just, just like, holding holding it up with their bare hands. Like, it was nuts. The defense also showed evidence in past meteorological reports stating, no, no, there was no dew on the ground that morning. See? As the officer had testified to. Told you the dew was a weird thing. They also had expert forensic testimony that all of the state's blood stain pattern analysis was wrong or at least faulty. The defense expert testified that the blood droplets on Julie's shirt were transfer stains, not spatter, just as you said. Yeah. Because he had blood spatter on him. Yeah. And she grappled with him. Finally, the defense introduced the evidence about Tommy Lynn Sell's confession, offering up an alternative theory or alternative perpetrator. But Ed Parkinson... Our beloved prosecutor dug in, calling it a myth. 
and said that Tommy Lynn Sells would have confessed to anything just to get out of his cell on death row. How? Hold up, homie. How How is that going to get him out of his cell on death row? I think he means that... Like, to interact. He, he thought that if he had to go on trial for another right, murder, he would just be out of- then it would extend whatever. I'm not sure that I believe that. I I, I think know. it's a dumb argument. Because the evidence still points to it regardless. Yeah. Ed also called out that Julie claimed it may have been a teenager who attacked them. But Tommy Lincells was 33 at the time. So the defense offered up a copy of Tommy's driver's license from that time that showed his height and weight matched her description. Oh, wow. And his picture even looks quite a bit like the composite sketch. See what I'm talking about? Like his features just, I mean, it's not exact because the composite sketch is very. I mean, they're generic. It is pretty generic. But. I mean, like, composite like sketches can, tend to be generic when it comes to, like, age. Yeah. It's hard to do that because it's a flat image. Yeah. In the end, Julie testified this time around, and then it was time for the jury to deliberate. After 12 hours, they found her not guilty, and the state of Illinois issued her a certificate of innocence. That's awesome. Yep. Len Kirkpatrick... Joel's father still believed that Julie was guilty and that justice was not served. Ed Parkinson had another prosecutor represent the state during the verdict because he, quote, had a bad feeling about it. What a freaking coward. I concur. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what to say about that. No, I mean, but that's the truth. He knew that it was going to, he knew that, ah, go ahead. Yeah. Just angry. Yeah. Same. So, Julie's free. Yay. Good. Tommy Lynn Sells is still on death row. Good. For a while, Julie went on to advocate for women wrongfully convicted. Mm-hmm. And for a time, she even worked teaching at a university. Unfortunately, in her most recent interview, I believe was with the New York Times. Unfortunately, in that interview, she shared that she has been suffering from PTSD ever since, and she feels she will always have a scarlet letter because she was branded a child killer. Yeah. Like, I guess the teaching job was like the one of the only like jobs that panned out for a while and everything else she's tried to do she either like can't get hired right because as soon as she admits well this is the gap in my resume this is the yeah exactly it doesn't matter that she has a certificate of innocence they are like oh and then she never hears from them or everything she does start to do she struggles she just struggles because she has ptsd so she even got um i read a little clip that she had even gotten like a service dog to help but she's just struggled and at the time of the interview she was actually unemployed after having years of like struggling to keep a career going she said that joel still needs justice because her acquittal had just gotten them back to ground level yeah she's like he he still didn't see justice but unfortunately as well Tommy Lynn Sells recanted at least parts of his confession later, but many who worked or covered the case feel like it's not surprising, (laughs) given that he has, like, psychopathic tendencies. Right, yeah. So the fact is he still said a lot that indicated that he was there, that he did do it. All of the witness testimony of, like, people who encountered a strange man that fits his description, he blah, told, blah, blah. Like, he totally did it. Yeah. Last and final thought or fact. Of course, Tommy was never convicted for Joel's murder, but he was sentenced to death for those other convictions. And he did get put to death on April 3rd, 2014. I have no comment on that. 
I mean, glad he's not taking off space. That sounds horrible, but I don't know what yeah. else to say. I, I mean, know you don't like the death penalty, but like for me, I, and I've shared that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just don't think. I think it gets handed out too, too easily, if you will. And I don't like the way it's handed out. I do agree with you on that. Like, I don't I just, think yeah. jurors should be responsible for that. Yeah, I just don't think that. That's my only issue with it. I have no problem killing him. But Die. killing serial <laughs> killers is... Yeah. I, I have to admit, I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, like, you don't need to They're be not alive. likely to be rehabilitated at no. that point. So. No, 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 no. So, no, no, yeah. No. So, there you go. Right. It's wow. not, it's not, I know, I wish I had like a happier ending. No, but I think this is a great example of how true crime isn't like media portrayals. Like this is it. It it ended, but it didn't end well for Julie. And, you know, yeah. her ex-husband still believes it was her because his grieving process stopped when this started. And that's, I, I like, I know that it's hard to believe, but I can't blame him for being stuck in that position. Yeah, you know, I, like he needs well, help. Initially, as far as he knew and saw evidence in the first trial, right? I agree, it did not look good for Jolie, <laughs> right? But the one thing that had me, like before I knew the whole story, the one thing that had me is nine times out of ten, if a person who is accused of a crime tells you a story. And sticks to that story, yeah, and never falters. It never changes. Most of the time, they are telling the truth. Yeah, like nobody's that good at not, or I won't say nobody, but not. Yeah. Most people are not that good at lying that they can keep track of all their lies and exactly what all the right. details. And she obviously had to tell her story multiple times. So many times. So that was my number one thing. I do understand people thought her behavior was a little bit weird. She seems a little bit weird. I'm not going to lie. Like the way that she talks, yeah, like listen. she's just very soft spoken and she's and when she cries, it almost it's one of those things that like some women in particular, but men too can be some people just when they cry, it feels weird. Feels weird. Yeah. Like it doesn't seem like you kind of question, like, are, yeah, is that for real? For it's sure. like women that sneeze, like, at you, and you're like, yeah, that's not your real sneeze. Stop it. Yeah, you're faking it. Why are you faking sneeze? For sure. <laughs> like, so I, I get that it looked, it did not look good for her, right. and I do not blame Len Kirkpatrick for no. initially taking that stance. But I was a little surprised to see that after Tommy Linsell's admitted to it, that even then, like. Len Kirkpatrick still right. was like, no, I mean, she did it. I mean, I can see it, especially if he's not getting any help to like go to process the death of Joel, you know, it, you know, it's just tough, but I'm, wow. I was on the edge of my seat this entire case. You did such a great job. Thank you. It's a lot. So what I would like to do for the live session is maybe go in a little bit more into Tommy Lincell's. Yeah, I would love I that. thought about doing like a whole episode on him, but then I was like, you know. Well, we know how it ends now. Like oh. I shared enough of his story that I felt oh, like. No, I think eh. it's totally fine. I'm sad. so yeah. yeah, I think I'll do that and then we'll, yeah, we'll have a good time. So if you're listening still. Yes. And you want to join us for our Patreon live. Just three dollars a month. Our we'll get you our live sessions and yeah, whatnot. Anyway, if you want to know, our Patreon link is almost always in every single description or bio that you look at. You can find it. Okay. So if you're still with us and you want a Sunday shout out on the social medias, go ahead and leave us a cloud emoji because their day in the park, like the Saturday yeah. before Joel's murder him and Julie went to the park and the, and she said that they watched the clouds and like tried to, yeah, you know, find shapes. what's that game? Find shapes, find things in the clouds. Yeah. So go ahead and leave us a cloud emoji. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for covering this and thank you guys for listening. And I think that that's all we've got for you today and we will talk to you next week. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.